We're glad you're here. Welcome. I'm Felicity Ezewike. In August of 2022, in one slot, we reviewed questions arising from the controversial UK-Rwanda bill. The deportation proposal has been marred in legal battle since former Prime Minister Boris Johnson unveiled it in 2022. Despite the uproar, condemnation and vehement opposition of this bill, it has now become law. It has been passed by Parliament. On the scheme, any asylum seeker entering the UK illegally after the 1st of January 2022 would be sent to Rwanda to have their claims processed there. Successful or not, no asylum seeker would be able to apply to return to the UK. The goal, they say, is to deter people from arriving in the UK on small boats across the English Channel. It is pertinent to highlight that the UK Supreme Court ruled the scheme was unlawful, but the government found a way around the court's position by introducing a bill, making it clear in UK law, Rwanda is a safe country. Prime Minister Rishi Sunak says the first flights to Kigali will begin taking asylum seekers within 10 to 12 weeks. Britain is determined, and the lengths they have gone to belittles the UN's call for reconsideration and a warning the deportation plan threatens the rule of law and sets a perilous precedent globally. Ironically, Rishi Sunak does have a global goal a fundamental change in the global equation on migration, his words. The legislation is expected to receive royal assent from King Charles later this week and will then become law. So, what now? To help with some clarity is a former lecturer and senior research fellow at the University of Johannesburg, Dr. Cristiano De Rossi. His article, Outsourcing Asylum Seekers, the case of Rwanda and the UK originally led me to him in 2022. He now joins us again for you know, an updated conversation on the subject of the UK-Rwanda deal. Thank you very much, Doctor, for speaking with us. Thank you so much, Felicity, to have me here again. It's our pleasure. Now, considering the vehement fight that has been put up, did you expect that the Rwanda deal would become law? And what, what, what were your initial thoughts when that law was passed yesterday? Well, um, first of all, Felicity, I, I would like to uh, highlight something that is very peculiar because I don't know if um, uh, in the audience knows that the UK, uh, in the UK, we have a minister for, the, for immigration but we also have a minister for illegal immigration. So there are two different ministries, and this highlights how delicate is the, the, I mean, the topic, you know, in, in the UK. So, and also, which is the position of this government? This show clearly uh, to fight against illegal immigration very vehemently. Actually, I mean, the bill was proposed by uh, the UK government in conjunction with the new treaty with Rwanda, uh, following the important UK Supreme Court finding in November 2023, that person removed to Rwanda faced a real risk of being sent onwards to the country of origin, in violation that uh, the principle of non refoulement the, the refugee law principle. So the UK is prohibited from uh, subjecting uh, even indirectly people uh, to refoulement, uh, including under Article 3 of the European Convention on Human Rights, under the Refugee Convention, where the principle of no refoulement is set in Article 33, and under also a range of other international instruments. Uh, while the UK Rwanda Treaty contains certain provision, aimed at the prevention of this, uh, of the rejection, the refoulement, the Supreme Court judgment in 2022, in November, clearly showed the importance of ensuring that people can seek independent judicial scrutiny of the alleged safety of a removal destination. And that's the pro one of the problems of this bill, is that this bill prevents individuals 
from having any meaningful recourse to UK courts in relation to the key question of refoulma or rejection. Uh, refoulma is a French word, but rejection is the English equivalent. Such as by excluding the examination of any claim that Rwanda will not act in accordance with its treaty commitments. The bill requires decision makers to regard Rwanda as safe for removal, and this is regardless of the specific facts on the ground. And this is another big problem. And it explicitly prohibits UK courts from considering the risk of Rwanda sending people onwards to other countries, as well as the fairness and the effectiveness of asylum procedure in the African country. So that's 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 a problem that should be taken into consideration, and and the government and the parliament doesn't do do not seem to take to take them into consideration. That's why I I I believe that the procedure will will, will follow uh, unless something will intervene in the meantime. A party will investigate on that afterwards and. And the bill will become a law, uh, even next week, in fact. Because although, and this is something else that I would like to, uh, to, to highlight, uh, this bill gives authority to a minister to decide whether to comply with interim measure issued by the European Court of Human Rights in relation to the removal to Rwanda. And this notwithstanding that these measures are binding. So basically, the, the minister can disregard what the European uh, Court of Human Rights say. And you, you understand that it's 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 a, it's very problematic. Yes. I mean, to to approve to translate the bill into an act, but right. the, the, it seems to me that this it doesn't interest a lot the Parliament in the UK, where uh, where. Of course, Mr. Sunak has the majority, and that's why I, I think, as I said, unless something else will happen, as it happened already in November, uh, the, this this uh, bill will would be enacted as, a, as as an act, in fact. I mean, if you look at it, like I mentioned when we had this conversation earlier, the UK is not peculiar in its decision to find a way to stop illegal migration. Other uh, European countries, including Austria and Germany, are also looking at agreements to process asylum seekers in third country. How much of a bad precedence is it really, other than one country putting teeth to long-held plans? Well, I mean, you know, <laughs> uh, as I also told you last year, I, I would like to avoid you know, to for I mean at least to express too much politically my my views because uh, I would like to remain uh, as much legal as possible. But it, it's true that uh, this is uh, this is something that is happening in the entire Europe. And 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 of course, one of uh, if this bill will be enacted, uh, this will also you know give inspiration to other countries. Uh, to imitate the UK, uh, even if they belong to, I mean, even if they belong to, to uh, I mean, to the European Union. Uh, we have the example, I mean, we, we have already in several countries enact policies that prevents, for example, NGOs to act to, uh, I mean, to help, uh, to help uh, migrants in danger, for example. We have the example of, of Hungary, where the, the prime minister clearly said that he doesn't he doesn't want um, immigrants in Hungary in, uh, anymore. Uh, I'm I'm originally Italian, and 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 we also are, are experiencing with the right wing government uh, similar practices. You know, this is a win that uh, his. Uh, I mean, we are having in, in the entire Europe at the moment, and will probably be confirmed. In the, in the imminent European election that, of course, we, they won't concern the UK, but they will concern also uh, other, other countries where this uh, right-wing wind, it's, it's really something, I mean, it's very oppressive for migrants, in, in fact. 
All right, I, I'll, I'll try my utmost not to delve too much into the politics of it, but to look at the legalities. And that takes me to sure. the uh, reaction from Amnesty International UK's chief executive, who said that the bill takes a hatchet to international legal protections for some of the most vulnerable people in the world, and that it is a matter of, it is a matter of, um, let me see now, it is a matter of national disgrace, they said, that the political establishment has let the bill pass. But my question is, highlight some of these violations to international legal protection for us. Well, I mean, uh, I, I put aside, you know, the question of uh, the, the thing of being a national disgrace or not, because I'm not a UK, a, a, a UK citizen and I, I want to, you know, I don't want that uh, UK citizen can be offended in any way. But uh, of course, this new legislation is, 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 is the third in a series of uh, restrictive uh, UK laws that have eroded access to refugee protection in the UK since 2022 when we, when we last talked, including the ban on access to asylum or other forms of permission to stay in the UK for those arriving irregularly via a third country, while, for example, the, the, the Geneva Convention says that even if someone arrives irregularly in a country, he has the right to apply for asylum. So in this case, in the UK, it's, it's denied to people arrive irregularly even to have access to a refugee, you know, institution to apply for asylum. So, I mean, uh, 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 of course, of course, I mean, it's a, uh, uh, there is a problem uh, of, of, you know, of, of an offense to the dignity and safety of this, of this migrant that are considered as vulnerable people. And, and, you know, there were, uh, uh, today, I mean, uh, there was uh, this uh, joint, uh, uh, joint, uh, uh, you know, press release by the the, the director of uh, um, I mean, Mr. Grandi and Mr. Turk, that they are the High Commissioner for Human Rights and High Commissioner for Refugees, that highlighted the the the, the problem. I mean, behind uh, behind the this bill, if it will be enacted, in fact, it's a uh, and, and you know, it's a uh, and and. Uh, Particularly, Mr. Turk, the High Commissioner for Human, the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, highlighted the fact that shifting responsibility for refugees and reducing the UK court's ability to scrutinize removed decisions, and also restricting access to legal red, uh, remedies in the UK. Uh, I mean, this all this uh, this new legislation will uh, hinder the rule of law in the UK. And will set, as I mentioned before, a, a, a perilous, a dangerous precedent globally. In fact, because okay. it's critical to the protection. Oh, sorry. Yeah, sorry. Please. Uh, no, no, it's fine. It's fine. Um, I was just going to uh, bring up an aspect that. Sure. Rwanda is a tiny nation of 13 million people, and it claims to be one of the most stable countries in Africa. But you and I both know that rights groups and all kinds of groups have accused veteran president uh, Paul Kagame of ruling in a climate of fear and stifling dissent and free speech. So talk us through, if you can, the rationale behind the safety of Rwanda bill, which on a very basic level um, 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 says UK sees Rwanda as a completely safe place to send these uh, refugees or asylum seekers. Yes, Felicity. I mean, thanks for the question. You know, I mean, my my answer is is is, is twofold. Uh, I mean, in the sense that um, as I also uh, mentioned you uh, the last time we talked, we have to consider. Uh, globally, the real politique that President Kagame, uh, I mean, put in place in these decades of governance. So President Kagame, of course, tried to legitimate himself and his power, making, having good relation uh, with the most powerful countries in the world. 
and I mean, he he visited. Uh, I mean, the U the he visited uh, the U.S. several times and stuff. So I mean, we we have to. I mean, he he, he knows. The government of Rwanda knows that if asylum seekers were will be sent in Rwanda from the UK, Rwanda will have the eyes of the entire world on it. So, and and, and of course, I'm, I logically I don't believe that this asylum seeker, this particular asylum seeker, will be mistreated because of course the uk we, we, we i'm sure wants guarantees on that because he want that everything as 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 told until now will become the reality in the sense that even you know that uh, the, the the asylum seekers will uh, will uh, will be sent to rwanda for the safety you know to try to to fight against the the traffickers and etc. So, and this is, I think, one side that needs to be in consideration. The 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 the, the asylum seekers sent to Rwanda from the UK won't be the average asylum seeker arriving to Rwanda, or have, they have arrived to Rwanda from DRC, from Burundi, uh, from other African countries. But of course, on the other side. On, on the other side, we, I mean, it's on the record that the, the, the uh, you know, organization, NGOs, I mean, AMS International, Human Rights Watch, have previously raised concern about Rwanda's asylum process, citing arbitrary denial of access to the asylum procedure, risk of detention and deportation, discrimination against LGBTIQ asylum seekers, inadequate legal representation for asylum seekers. So, I mean, the problem in the country in Rwanda are there. But it's true on the other side that this probably, I don't know, but probably these asylum seekers sent from Rwanda, they are not the average asylum seekers arriving in Rwanda or have arrived in Rwanda in all these decades. Uh, I mean, so so it's a bit difficult for me to give, I mean, to provide a, a, a final response to, okay. to your question. But but of course, one thing is for sure that this, I mean, these asylum seekers probably they will be stranded in the sense that if they think they can have, you know, they can have rights to work. I mean, you know, as as you said, Rwanda is a tiny country. So I don't know how many opportunities they will have, uh, there okay. will be for these asylum seekers. Now, we, yes. we know that there has been no deportation so far in terms of the deal. The last one was stopped, but Britain has already paid Rwanda 240 million pounds. That's a concern on the one hand. Um, it also hopes to send <coughs> thousands of migrants uh, to Rwanda. At the moment, the country only has the capacity, we understand, to take a few hundred. What are the likely implications for Rwanda? Should the UK follow through long term sending um, these asylum seekers in their numbers? Yeah, uh, this is something, uh, this is also something that is not easily uh, predictable in the sense that. Uh, the capacity of absorption absorp of Rwanda, in the, I mean, it's it's small, as you said. So now, but the money has been already paid. So what what will happen? Uh, we know that the UK, even uh, before, and probably also now, they are looking also other countries, uh, possibly in Africa, that can act as you know, uh, another Rwanda. Uh, but as I said, what will happen to this asylum seeker in Rwanda? There will be many or too many according the capacity of the Rwanda, uh, the Rwanda social, cultural and economic fabric to, to take them. I don't know. I mean, of course, the, the, the more they will be sent, 
the more the condition won't be good because this is, this is normal. If in a if in an apartment that can contain uh, five people, I mean, they, they leave 15 people, of course, the condition of the 15 people in the apartment, it can be as good as Indeed, if not, not, not to talk of the economic so uh, implications and other health implications that come with such Yeah, a I mean, there will be, they, they, yeah. they can have, in fact, problems, I mean, access to healthcare. I mentioned before the problem in access, I mean, profitable work environment and, and stuff in the sense that it will be very difficult, in my opinion, that these asylum seekers, if they will be granted asylum in Rwanda, they they can have access to the 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 work. I mean, the, the marketplace and 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 to the work uh, the, to the job market easily. But we also right. have, in fact, health implications that they also need to be considered to taken into very serious consideration. So it's uh, you know yeah. it's uh, there are all this. I mean, there are all this um, you know unknown. It's like these people, these um, asylum seekers, they will be sent to a destiny that is, for the most part, is unknown. Indeed. And it's very difficult to predict it. Indeed, it is. Uh, but I will ask you a question I asked uh, the last time we talked. And yeah, that sure. has to do with what kind of conversations would you advise African leaders to be having regarding the issue of migration in all its forms um, in, in, in light of this persistent um, uh, desire and move by other European countries to send asylum seekers who are looking for refuge, but maybe back to other third world countries? Look, uh, until now, this is a problem that has not been raised <laughs> at the level of the African Union. So as I also, I mean, I have to repeat myself, but until now, these are uh, situation they are considered more as domestic, you know, domestic affairs of 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 sovereign countries in Africa. So if uh, if we will stay uh, at the moment, we don't have any any you know uh, regional or sub-regional declaration or statement in Africa uh, about uh, this situation. Uh, of course, if if the thing will be smooth, probably other countries will offer and and everything will remain at the domestic you know level if in, in converse the you know also because uh, let's be clear on that uh, rwanda uh, in the framework of of the african union is one of uh, under many aspects has been considered one of the best country at the level of the african union also in 2021 i think they signed a memorandum um, President Kagame to take uh, to take uh, refugees that were uh, detained in the in the in the camps in Libya. So at the Africa at the level of of, of the, the African level, I don't think that the that the authorities, African authorities, can can discuss the good fate of of Rwanda at this point. And and I, my sense is that they will remain silent as much as they can. And, and see what will happen. Oh, wow. If, as I, yeah, so if things will, will go smooth, probably, as I said, nothing will be said. On the contrary, if, you know, there will be a difficult, a difficult process for these asylum seekers, I mean, if they will arrive in Rwanda to be settled and they will be mistreated at some point, at that point, possibly we will have some reaction at sub-regional and regional level. Quite but at the moment, I don't really. see any... Yeah. It, it, it's yeah, sad, sorry. really, that um, African leaders are not speaking up in one way or the other about this deal. But then again, like you said, <laughs> they are waiting to see what happens. Thank yeah, you very much. I think that we're waiting, yes. I'm afraid that's where we'll have to stop today. Thank you very much, as always, for speaking with us. We appreciate your time and the insights you've provided to the conversation. Thank you so much, Felicity. Thank you so much. FinTech is being sold as the answer to Africa's problem, but are there downsides to digital money services being overlooked? That will be our focus after we come back from this break. So stay with us. On the one hand, FinTech 
Online financial products and services is heralded as the future. On the other hand, there are fears it could cause a crisis of consumer debt, emotional distress, self-harm and data piracy. There are also concerns about the role that the media plays. A group of researchers published recently on the conversation in March after a two-year study. They found that the coverage of fintech in African press is celebratory and offers limited cautionary and critical reporting to the public and to policymakers. These researchers worry that the breadth of fintech's expansion across Africa and extent of potential harm it carries, even if its critics are only minimally correct, indicates a pressing need for further analysis of what story is being told. They are urging news audiences, politicians and civil society to demand a more critical journalism. One of the three authors join me now to further discuss their findings and of course raise the bar on the conversation around media coverage is Chris Peterson, a professor of global communications at University of Leeds, West Yorkshire, UK. Thank you very much for giving us your time. Today. All right. Uh, let's begin with an understanding of the, you know, the drive to explore this uh, topic, the concept of fintech and its growing presence in Africa. We were aware that for about 10 years, fintech has been taking off really from the from early starts in Kenya and uh, has become seen as one of Africa's great success stories of, uh, of the last decade or so. And we're interested in the story that's being told by the, the press about fintech. Um, as well as the connection between press reporting and how governments think about fintech, uh, the extent to which they they regulate it. We were aware that uh, political economists have been raising warnings for a number of years uh, about the, the downsides of this technology and this trend. So we, uh, we said about uh, selecting a, a sample of uh, news coverage from around the continent and looking at it closely to see what what stories were being told. Uh, your article highlights the often overlooked downsides of digital money service in Africa. What are some of these downsides that it's being played down? One of them is the uh, the crisis of indebt indebtedness, uh, the, the idea that um, when everybody is presented with a route to easy money, that people will inevitably take advantage of that. And uh, some of the political economy studies that we point to in, in our conversation piece uh, suggest that uh, Africa is at, at risk of a, a major debt crisis in the coming years, similar to what um, the West experienced in, in 2008 uh, because of this ever-growing indebt indebtedness that has been enabled by the fintech technology. Um, we're also concerned with issues like data piracy, um, Northern countries are waking up now to the, the crisis of data piracy all around us. Uh, a few multinational corporations know about us and track every aspect of our lives. So those companies are now very actively exporting that model to the global south. Uh, and, and, and Africa has effectively become the test bed for that. Um, there, are, there are other concerns that have, that have come up. Uh, uh, essentially that um, much of the story is about Africa, uh, about Africa's poverty being reduced by uh, fintech. But uh, again, we, we point to a good deal of research that's suggesting that's, that's not actually the case and, and that there are, there are risks of poverty being increased. All right. I'd like you to um, expand a little on the concerns that you have about 
how the media's portrayal of fintech is contributing to overlooking uh, the downsides. And maybe if you can add to it why it is imperative that these downsides are not swept under, but put so that we're accepting the, uh, the plus side of fintech, we also know the downsides and how to prepare for it. Yeah, um, and, and, and I'm more comfortable doing that, Felicity, because I'm not an economist. I'm, I'm somebody who studies the media, so I'm, I'm happier to, to talk about that. In the analysis that we did, we see that the most of the press coverage that's happening is uh, celebratory. It's, it's singing the praises of the fintech industry, and it's really offering very little in the way of a cautionary or, or critical reporting. Uh, to the public or to policymakers, and that strikes us as a concern. We, we found that fintech is most often covered uh, with a positive tone and essentially as just another business story. Um, and, and this is interesting to me as somebody who's written about the overall media image of the African continent uh, over over many decades, um, there, there has often been the accusation that the press tends to lean towards an Afro-pessimism discourse, just cover negative stories. Um, but FinTech has fit the opposite story, which is the Afro-optimism story or, or an Africa rising kind of story. And I think that's, while we haven't been in the newsrooms asking why these stories appear, it seems to fit a pattern that suggests uh, that, that the press are eager for that for that Africa rising story whenever it comes up, and, and fintech, fintech has fit that for them. Uh, so, some of the things that that, that we've that we've found uh, most of the stories that have been published about fintech are essentially announcements, sort of self excited celebratory announcements of, of new developments, new products that are available, celebrating innovation. Um, this tends to uh, create the, the, the sense that there's, there's, there's constantly good things happening. Um, we, we, we looked for stories that suggested any form of trepidation or, or any form of caution and um, found that even in stories that, that presented that tone, they still took an overall positive approach, uh, essentially suggesting that any potential dangers could easily be uh, dealt with by responsible corporations and responsible governments that are uh, that are on top of the problem. So what we suggest in, in, in our article is that this is essentially a process of sanitizing the fintech industry, making it uh, appear safe for the public. Uh, and in terms of, of selling the product, that's really good for the industry, but it's not necessarily good for consumers. All right. Did you maybe um, take a look at the, let me see now, uh, the risks that, um, uh, and it, it might not be, but is it possible that you took a look at the risk associated um, with digital money services, uh, such as mobile money and cryptocurrencies, and how these impact on vulnerable populations like the poor and the unbanked? That's not our research because we are we are media researchers. Uh, but what we do in the uh, in the article is is point to a, a fairly substantial set of research that is um, raising those worries. Uh, economists writing about the 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 risk of increasing consumer debt, of uh, the emotional distress that being in debt causes uh, even reports of of self-harm are out there uh, and and uh, what I mentioned earlier the the, the threat of data pri data piracy the, the threat of all uh, the, the, the corporations involved in this gathering up and selling uh, information about uh, all of us all about all of these millions of new potential users that that are out there so these are the kinds of risks 
that we are referring to when we warn that a celebratory message from media is uh, potentially dangerous, that, that um, it, it, it risks continually pushing these services on us without proper government scrutiny um, or uh, public scrutiny as, as, as to the risk. Okay. Okay, from your research, uh, what roles do you think the regulators should be playing in ensuring the responsible growth of fintech in Africa? Yes, the media has its role to play, but what about the regulators? I'm going to be cautious there because, again, this isn't really my specialist area. Uh, I think our, our concern is that the the journalism industry play its watchdog role in terms of uh, alerting government and the public as to the potential dangers that are out there. Um, but we, I, I think broadly, we would like to see government taking those dangers more seriously and being more cautious in terms of its uh, tendency to embrace the industry and to take the industry's assurances that everything is fine, everything is safe, uh, to take those at face value. And I think that's what we have been seeing uh, as, as the attitude of policymakers right across the African continent. Um, it, it seems on the surface like an industry that makes everybody rich and everybody happy and uh and that message being repeated over and over again we would regard as as dangerous and yes, would just yeah. encourage encourage the media to look more closely yeah I, I did see the highlight in your um article and of course the links that were added there just to show what you were trying to uh portray the the dangers of you know the one-sided story um would there be a possibility of alternative suggestions based off of your study that could address the um, financial Africa's financial inclusion challenges without relying solely on fintech? It's, it's a question I wish I could hand over to my economist colleague, who was one of the people who who uh, wrote the article with us. Um, uh, I, I don't have a good answer to that because, as I say, I, I, I'm, I'm not an economist. My, my job is to uh, hold the press to account and, uh, and scrutinize what they do. So I think that's, that's what I'm going to limit myself to. Um, I think in, in, okay. in Has there general, been any yeah. development since your study when it comes to um, media coverage of uh, fintech and the impact it has on Africa? The short answer is, is, is none that we know of, um, but our study was limited to a particular period of time that ended about a year ago when we, when we, we stopped looking at that media coverage. So it is entirely possible that some media is scrutinizing a little bit more closely. We, we, we do try to keep an eye on it. We do see the occasional critical commentary come out uh, but we also see just just anecdotally uh, a, a continuation around the continent of a very celebratory uh, discourse about fintech. So um, I, I don't think we're making a big difference yet, but it's nice to have the chance to spread the message. Yes, indeed. Um, what would be your uh, what would be the ingredients of a robust and balanced um, a conversation around fintech and its development in Africa based off what you've, uh, I mean, studied of the subject? I, I think what we would encourage journalists, business journalists particularly, to do is to try very hard to get outside the bubble of the 
press releases and the conversations with business people that tend to uh, dominate their their sourcing of their stories uh, and and to perhaps engage with those skeptics a bit more. Um, I think that's that's one of the things that that we're encouraging. Uh, for me, this is this is part of a uh, a critical examination of different forms uh, of of imperialism that still occur across the African continent that involve communications in some way. And 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 my research in many different ways uh, addresses that problem. And so uh, I I would like to see news people who are writing about fintech think about it in those wider terms what are the interests of the foreign players who are pushing these technologies um, do they have interests particularly of poor africans at heart when they are pushing these services on them uh, when they present them as completely safe um, is in whose interest is that argument uh, and, and similarly, I'd like to see pressure from the media on on policymakers who are having now to negotiate what to do. It's you know, it's it's a, it's a new do, technology. Do you, do you sincerely see the media's um, coverage, however it is presented, truly impacting uh, the evolution of fintech, uh, not just in Africa but across the world? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I'm a critic of media, but I'm also a believer in its power to orchestrate uh, positive change. Um, commercial organizations uh, exist by being popular and 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 selling their products, and when people ask hard questions about them they are typically quick to to a, a adapt to um, try to meet the standards that the public are setting. Currently with fintech, we have a situation where uh, corporations can move into a, a, an almost unregulated brand new market with hundreds of millions of potential consumers, uh, customers. And you know what, what a lovely thing that is for the the global corporate sector but not necessarily the best thing uh for for those potential customers Ralph, i guess we'll have to leave it there for today thank you very much for speaking with us on such short notice we do appreciate your time mm -hmm. and the insight that you have provided it's a pleasure thank you thank you and that's how we wrap it up today on One Slot. We thank you, as always, for your kind attention. If this conversation and the other we had about the UK asylum deal holds interest for you and maybe you missed it, you can catch up on our YouTube channel. That's at New Central TV. Not just One Slot, all the other engaging conversations we have here at New Central. I'll see you next time. Bye for now. Mm -hmm.